So why don't you uh, turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter two, Exodus chapter two, and we're gonna start a new series, God is Calling <clears throat> today. So turn in your Bibles to Exodus two. If you need a Bible, just wave at one of the ushers. They'll be glad to let you borrow one. You can keep it, it's our gift to you. As you're turning to Exodus two, actually we'll start a little bit in, in chapter one. Um, let me ask you this question. Have you ever known anybody who asked, where is God? Where is God right now? Especially in times of tragedy, in times of suffering, loss, death. Has God forgotten about us? They'll say, maybe you've said that yourself. Maybe you're saying it even right now. If so, boy, did you come on the right day. Because as we get started on this new series... Our text is going to take us back into a time and a context 3,500 years ago when people were asking the very same thing. The Israelites, God's chosen people, they're the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They'd been living in Egypt now for the better part of 400 years after uh, moving there during the epic life and journey of Joseph. That son of Jacob who had the coat of many colors. And you remember, he had been taken there as a hostage, sold as a slave. But in God's roundabout way, he was working to make Joseph a savior of sorts who would have the foresight to interpret uh, a dream and help the Pharaoh to understand, you're going into seven years of famine after seven years of plenty. We need to save up grain. And the Pharaoh promotes him. And that little young man from Israel becomes a savior of all Egypt. At the end of Genesis, you see the Pharaoh looking favorably upon Joseph. And he says, go back to the, your promised land. Why don't you bring your, your family out of the famine? and You can move here where you've stockpiled for us plenty. You can move your whole family of of. Uh, 70, 75 of them, that's all the Israelites there were. You can move them to the land of Goshen, and so they did. And that's where the story of Genesis ends. The story of Exodus begins 400 years later. And that's a critical 400 years, <clears throat> because two things in particular happened during those 400 years. Those 70 or so Israelites, they had multiplied now to several million Second thing that happened, you see in Exodus 1, 8, it says there rose up a king who knew not Joseph. Well, of course he knew not Joseph. It had been 400 years since Joseph had uh, been the savior of Egypt and the whole Middle East, really. And so this Pharaoh, 400 years later, he didn't know any of that story. He didn't care or appreciate anything about Israel or their history or why they were living in his land. All he knew is that there are several million Jewish people here, and he was a little nervous about some sort of insurrection or overthrowing. And, and so he, in an effort to, to, to keep his nation secure, devised a plan. He devised a plan to, to sort of squash the Hebrews, those Jewish people. His plan was quite simply, we're going to beat them into slavery. We're going to press them. We'll just wear them down to the nub, turn them into slaves. But the Bible says the more they were turned into slaves, the more they multiplied. They kept being fruitful and multiplied. So he has to turn to plan B, the Pharaoh does. And this was more of a covert operation, but he tells the midwives who were responsible for birthing, helping to birth the, 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 the Hebrew babies. Whenever it's a boy, you're just to snuff him out. Just kill all the baby boys. It's infanticide. It wasn't broadcasting or doing it in any big, loud sort of way, but it's a terrible thing that was going on. But it tells us, the text does, that the midwives, they wouldn't comply with this command. And so Pharaoh called the midwives into, their pal into the palace. And he says in verse 18, why have you done this? Why have you allowed these boys to live? And they respond very cleverly. They say, well, Pharaoh, verse 19, because the Hebrew women, they're not like the Egyptian women. 
The Hebrew women, they're vigorous, and they give birth before the midwife even gets to them. And the babies just pop out, you know, and before we can even get there. And the text says in verse 20, so God dealt well with the midwives. He blessed them with children of their own. Now, we know in Romans 13 and in 1 Peter 2 that all of us who are believers, we always obey the laws of the land, but there is one exception. And that exception shows up in Acts 5.29, and that is if the laws of the land ever come into conflict with God's law, we always prefer what God has said. And they chose God's way. Those midwives did. They chose for those babies to live and he looked favorably upon them. Perhaps it was just because there were sheer numbers or perhaps it was because he was intimidated by the faith that they had in their one God and that he didn't really know. Perhaps it was because of their tenacity. Perhaps it was just because of their obvious unwavering confidence in their Lord of history. But with, with this plan thwarted, he did a plan C. He just announced to the whole nation of Egypt a national mandate. Whether you're Hebrew, whether you're Egyptian, if you spot a little baby Hebrew boy, you're to throw him into the Nile. Just outright genocide now against all the Hebrew baby boys. And so now these Hebrew women were frightened at the thought of having a baby boy. I think it's helpful to remember in our times of trouble, particularly when there's unspeakable violence like there was in Dayton and El Paso and continues to be in other places all the time, to remember that every generation has been blighted by unspeakable evil. This is nothing new. We're not the first generation of people to face these types of terrible atrocities. We're not the first people to call out, God, what are you doing? Where are you in this? The Israelites 3,500 years ago, they were calling out the very same thing. Have you forgotten us? We're slaves down here. They're killing our children, if you haven't noticed. The narrator is conveying the natural human response that all of us have when things are getting worse and worse. Where are you, God? Have you forgotten us? But he hadn't forgotten them. He hadn't forgotten them and he hadn't forgotten us. No, in fact, unbeknownst to them, God was taking the very worst thing that these people could have ever imagined in that time and context. And he's preparing to do immeasurably more than they could have ever asked or imagined. For right beneath the Pharaoh's nose, God was going to work to bring into this world the very baby who would become Israel's deliverer, Moses, the prince of Egypt. Let's read about him in chapter two, starting at verse one. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. And she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile, and his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Verse five, then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the riverbank and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her fem female slave to get it. And she opened it and she saw the baby and he was crying and she felt sorry for him. And she said, this is one of the Hebrew babies. And then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go out and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse this baby for you? And she answered, yes, go. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I'll pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. And she named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. Now, this text could easily be skimmed right 
through as we rush to get on to better known portions of the life and the story of Moses. But if you zip right through these verses, you'll miss several foundational truths, including a chance to really get to know Moses' birth mother and father. Three in particular, three things that I think he wants us to glean from this passage today about learning to trust in him. That's what he's calling all of us to do, is to put our trust in him. First thing I noticed from this text, if you put your trust in him, your soul will stay anchored in tumultuous times. Your soul will stay anchored You say, where do you see this? Ah, you would miss it. But see, verse one is taking pains to tell us the man that's being born, this this baby is being born to a man of the tribe of Levi who married a Levite woman. So what? What they're telling us is this baby who's going to be born is a purebred Levite. Of all the 12 tribes of Israel, both his mom and dad come from the tribe of Levi. Why does it matter? Because the Levites were the one of the 12 tribes that readily showed loyalty to Yahweh. In fact, they will soon become the clergy for all of Israel. And this is significant because Joshua 24 is going to tell us later that in these troublesome times that the Israelites were living in of slavery in Egypt, that many of the Israelites had forsaken God. They'd given up on God. They'd chosen lesser gods, things that they could touch and hang on to. I don't know about that God in the sky anymore. I don't know if he's really with us anymore. They'd forsaken the one true God. But the author's telling us clearly here, not this family. Not this mom and dad. Now there was at least one family who still trusted the one true God. It's the family that came from the tribe of Levi. They'd never forgotten the stories that they'd heard for years about how God had rescued their forefathers, their ancestor Joseph from starvation. And even before that, how he had brought Abram and Sarah from the land of Ur of the Chaldeans over to the promised land where eventually he would give them their son, long promised, Isaac. So despite all the terrible things that were going on around them, they knew God, our God, is still in control. And the author is wanting to make sure that we understand that though this family might have been a minority among the Israelites, this family still believed. This was still a believing family. And so you picture that day when she gives birth to this baby, Moses. And you picture the midwife saying, shh, it's a boy. And don't you know that in that moment, a thought of terror just shot into this heart and mind of this this mom, who we'll find out in chapter six is called Jochebed. And don't you know that she being a faithful person prayed in her heart, God, we've clung to you thus far and we're gonna cling with you further yet. This is your baby boy. You've given to us, given him to us. You know everything that's going on in this wild and crazy world. You know about the edict from the Pharaoh. So you just tell us what to do with him and how do we take care of him? What's your plan, God? And he gave her the plan. So after keeping him secure for those first three months, now he's getting bigger and harder to hide. His lungs are getting bigger and his cries getting louder. And so something had to be done. So she built a small basket of papyrus from the river using some tar or pitch to waterproof it. And then it says she gently placed her son in that basket. Uh, Scholars point out, technically she was obeying the laws to put her son into the Nile. She just did so by use of a floating basket. Chuck Swindoll says you, you just have to read between the lines here and use your sanctified imagination so you don't miss 
the emotion of all that was going on here. Surely Jacobid for three months had been spying. What am I going to do? Give me the plan, God. And she'd notice there is a daughter of the Pharaoh who comes down to this part of the Nile most every day. She comes with her attendant girls, and this is where they do their bathing. She'd inventoried that. And sure enough, that day, after she'd set the baby basket with Moses in it among the reeds in that portion of the Nile, there came the entourage. First came the servant girls and then the princess. And those Egyptian ladies, they hear the cry from the basket and they go to the basket and they open the basket and they look inside the basket and they say, oh, it's one of the Hebrew baby boys. And don't you know that all of time stood still in that moment? Particularly for Jacobid, wherever she was, surely somewhere spying out what was happening. And don't you know that she was praying, oh God, this is the moment. Help her not to do the wrong thing. Help her not to flip the basket over. Help her to do the right thing, God. Don't you know that in that moment, if she hadn't given her boy over to God, she was giving him then. And really, there's no better act of faith for a mom or a dad than to realize early on, this child comes from you, God. He's yours. She's yours. I'm just going to be the, the mom or the dad for as long as you give them to me. You show me how to be the mom or the dad that you want me to be. Help me to teach him your and her your ways and your will. I've never forgotten the story about how my mom uh, used to tell me when I was growing up about the, the day when she was holding me in her arms in Methodist Hospital. I don't know whether it was a few hours or a day or so after I'd been born, but she said that she looked down upon me, and in that moment she prayed. She said, Lord, this is your boy. He's not mine. He's yours. And she offered me back up to him that day to be used for his purposes. And I've never forgotten that story. Couldn't forget it very well because she'd tell it to me every time I was in trouble. And, and, <laughs> but you know, that story made a mark on me knowing that I belonged to him. And don't you know that Jacob had, had rehearsed what's going to happen next with Moses' older sister, Miriam. They probably ran it six times, maybe a dozen times. Honey, you're gonna follow along the basket near the edge of the water, but don't get too close, just close enough that you can see. And if the princess looks inside the basket and ha has eyes of sympathy and tenderness on your brother in that moment, don't be too excited. Don't be too aloof. Just call out to her. Ma'am, sh sh shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to come and nurse this baby for you? And maybe, maybe, honey, she'll say yes. And that's just the way it happened. And subsequently, Moses' mother, Jacobin, gets to take her own baby, Moses, home as the nursemaid and adding to it, the princess even says, I'll pay you to take care of this baby that I'm going to adopt as my own someday. Jacobin, I think you have to know she had an anchored and steady soul even in the midst of these troubling times. The author of Hebrews will confirm it when we get to Hebrews in the New Testament, chapter 11, because there's that chapter, that section that's called the Hall of Fame, of the faithful, the Hall of Faith. And there he lists in verse 23, Moses' mom and dad. The Lord was Jacob's light and her salvation. Of whom should she fear? The Lord was her strength. Of whom should she be afraid? She and her husband, who we'll find out in chapter 6, was named Amran or Amran. They were people of deep abiding faith. And as such, they were able to perceive God has a plan for this baby of ours. 
Second thing. Second thing, if we put our trust in him, not only do we notice that we, we begin to have a sustained, anchored soul, even in the midst of turbulent times, but our children will be able to glean something from us, spiritually speaking. They'll be able to discover their soul-flourishing identity in him because we're modeling it for them. We're demonstrating the faith to them. As I heard one person say recently, if you're teaching something that you're not modeling, you're teaching something else. But Jacobet and Amron, they were modeling a real faith. And don't you know they knew we're on measured time. Our days are numbered because some scholars say it was probably when he was five. Maybe one says as late as eight. They knew they're going to have to take their baby boy back into the palace, into the care of the princess. And he'd become a prince of Egypt then. So they said, we've got to do the best we can with the years that we have, though they'll be limited. We've got to instill and install into him a faith in the one true God that will sustain him so that he'll know who he is and he'll know whose he is, even when he's left our home. And don't you know that probably most every day they told him again the story of the basket and the reeds and of God's purposes in his life that though they don't know what it's gonna be, it must be something good. And don't you know they looked into his eyes and they said to him, son, you're not one of them. You're going to live among them. You're gonna become a prince of Egypt, but you're not. You're one of God's chosen ones. You're one of his children. That's who you are, honey. That's your identity. Don't ever forsake the one true God. Don't you know, over and over, they were rehearsing that with him so that he would never forget. Incidentally, parents, nobody can have those kind of conversations with your child better than you can have that conversation with your child. Just looking into their eyes and saying, honey, you are a child of the one true God. And he's the one who created you with a purpose. And because the world is telling our children, you're, you have no purpose. And there's no meaning to all this thing. But the assurance comes from us reminding them, oh, no, there's a great God who loves you and is working all things together, together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. That's who you are. You're not a nobody. You're one of God's chosen ones. That's who you are. You say, well, that's a good reminder. I want to do that. I want to be that kind of mom or dad, but some of you are saying, if you're honest, I, I, this is kind of new to me. I don't know all of the stuff to say yet exactly, and what you got for me? That's the good news. Is why, that's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. That's why we have the... the the fantastic kids ministry that we have and the youth ministry that we have because we want to partner with you in helping you to do this so that you can become a more effective parent at instilling and installing a faith that will sustain your child when he or she gets old enough to launch. You want an example? An example of it taking place? Take a look at the screens. And let's listen to Noah and his mom tell the story. Um, I'm Noah, and I'm going to into fifth grade. And I'm Ashley. We've been coming to Faith Bridge for a little over six years. And when we first started coming to Faith Bridge, I had been passing by every day on my way to work. And I had been asking God at the time to lead me to a church where I could learn a little bit more about Him and what it meant to be a part of a godly community. I just remember after that first Sunday, I went to pick him up and he didn't want to leave. The first time I really felt like, okay, this is where we're meant to be is when I served with kids ministry during the summer. We did everything. We learned a lesson. We sang songs. We did praise and worship. I mean, it was like 
big level stuff. It wasn't just, we're gonna sit in a room and color pages and eat a snack and be done. And now I've made it up to the fifth grade room and it's even more exciting to be in that room to see them as they're older, like really starting to understand who God is and who they are in him. So Noah had to write an essay for his tutor and the writing prompt was to write about something that's important to you. And Noah hates to write. Um, he, could, he could write one story with three lines and consider it done because it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, so this essay that he chose to write was about God. And it is the longest essay that he has written with the most details. Have you ever put God in front of everything else? Several times I've put aside video games, TV, and read God's Word slash Bible. I've I had questions about the Bible, so whenever I read it, some of my questions got answered. I want to learn more about God. God is important to you and me. God is the one who created us in the whole world. He's given us a reason to live. He saved us from our sins. God is the Holy One. He is the Lord of Lords. God is important to you and me because He's our Savior. In reality, He is our shield. He protects us from danger and the devil. When Hurricane Harvey hit, God was there with me even though I was scared. The flood didn't hurt me or my house, family, and my pets. God was there with me. In conclusion, God will always be there with me, with me and you. The important thing is God is powerful. I certainly got all teary-eyed when he read it to me the first time. I still get teary-eyed when he reads it out loud. Being a single parent, sometimes it's a lot just to get home and get dinner on the table and Kids ministry is definitely a partnership, coming alongside and kind of carrying this load with me that like, it's not just up to me to help him figure out who he's meant to be or who God created him to be or who God is. Talking about scripture, what it means to be in the word, what it means to praise and worship, what it means to have a prayer life. And he can ask them questions and they'll tell him the answers honestly. They don't, you know, try to beat around the bush or, give him the the fairy tale version of the story I guess. It's funny because you know I think about church as being my godly community and until he wrote this essay it never really dawned on me that kids ministry is his godly community. Like they might be smaller in stature but they're still a godly community. For him to have that at such a young age it's it brings a sense of peace and joy because now, yes, it is mind-blowing. Now he's, he has this opportunity to walk with the Lord um, from such a young age. He's feeling empowered to chase after his own faith and choosing to be baptized and, sorry, spending time in God's Word on his own um, is really cool, really cool to see. Isn't that great? I love that. And I just love that there's so many moms and so many dads here, and particularly single moms and single dads, and you're prioritizing helping your children to grow spiritually. And I just know God has a blessing in that for you, for your faithfulness. And we want to partner with you, and we want to help you, because parenting is hard. One mom said, I, Ken, I don't know how I could do it uh, if, if I didn't have God in my life and his power being activated and the supportive community here at the church. And I agree. Parenting is hard. And it is confusing. Well, like one lady found out the hard way when she was determining to get her son's tonsils out. And she was meeting with the surgeon ahead of time. And she said, this is a little awkward, doctor, but um, we never had them circumcised. And uh, so when you have them under anesthesia, would you please do the circ as well as the tonsils? And the surgeon said, well, sure, that's easy enough. 
Well, several weeks later, that little boy had a friend over and they were playing and the mom overheard the little boy's friend say, hey, my parents say, I'm going to have my tonsils taken out just like you did. To which the first little boy said, well, (laughs) your tonsils may not be where they're telling you they are. (laughs) Wouldn't that be funny if that was true? All right, so <laughs> parenting, parenting is hard. But parents, you and I, we have the responsibility of helping our children connect with the one true God, to come to know his word. So let me ask you, do you ever share with your child, here's something that God's showing me in, in, in his word myself in my own devotional life. Some of you are saying even now, you don't even have much of a devotional life right now. Have I got something for you? Pull out your phone. Here's all you got to do. Text the word calling to 797979. And we'll start to send you the devotions that we've written for this study that we're doing on the life of Moses these coming weeks. I think they've written three per week. And everybody can do something three times a week, right? You can have some devotions. And then you have actually something that you're learning and that you're reading in God's word and that you can draw on and even share with others. All right, so we're talking about trusting in God. God's calling us to put our trust in him. Why? Because it's gonna stabilize and anchor our soul in tumultuous times. It's gonna give us a reservoir from which we can draw to help our children as they're coming along behind us. And last of all, A sound trust in the one true God will help us to hold the things of this life open-handedly. You see Jacob open-handed at the end of the text. It's really the most touching part, verse 10. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. And she named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. Jacob had surely known this day is going to come. The day has been come. She'd been telling Moses, honey, you're not going to live here forever. You're going to be moving. Actually, you're going to move to the palace, and you're going to be adopted by one of the Pharaoh's daughters. And I know that she's going to take care of you because she took care of you the moment she laid eyes upon you that first day. But don't you know that Jacob had knew that day is coming? And then it finally got there. And don't you know that, that final morning as she was getting him dressed and getting his hair combed, don't you know there was this mix of bitter and sweet, all confused inside of her soul. Picture them as they go through the palace gates and as they're greeted by the princess and as the princess hugs them both. And then picture her as she bends down and puts her hands on Moses' face and looks into his eyes and says one last time, remember who you are and remember whose you are. And then she turns after putting his hand into her hand and she has to walk out. Some of you, moms, dads, you'll be doing this even tomorrow. In other districts, you did it last week, or maybe there's another week of summer yet for you in other districts. Some of you, your five or your six-year-old, will march into kindergarten for the first time, and you're going to have to hold loosely because this day's finally here. Or maybe your former fifth grader who seems so big in elementary school now pulling into the middle school seems like, well, it's not so big anymore. And then there's high school, and then there's college, and then there's independent living, and then there's, then there's marriage, and then there's finally a day, like a day that we had on Thursday with one of our dear saints, Sherry Berkman, who went to be with the Lord, when we even have to be open-handed. Life is a progression, and certainly parenthood is a progression of letting goes, isn't it? But you know the thing that I think that we can learn here is that 
you get better at the letting go the more you have acted in faith letting go in the past. I think probably the reason that Jacobin could do this graciously is because she had already let go of Moses back there three months. She'd already entrusted him to God's care and she'd watched God work this hard or this far and she knew he's not gonna stop at this point. And so we build upon the choices that we've made in the past. And we look back into the reservoir of scenes where God has come through and we say, okay, God, I'm, I'm letting go now. And I'm going to ask you to come through once more. I think that's how Jacob had got through that because she'd learned to rest in the knowledge that God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes she knew if i trust in the lord with all of my heart and lean not on my own understanding if in all my ways i acknowledge him he'll make my path straight she learned that if i trust him to be working behind the scenes even when every appearance would indicate he's he's checked out in the end in the long run we will be vindicated, we who have faith. We have put our trust in him. And that's how we hold things open-handedly. Incidentally, we'll be taking this journey with Moses the next several weeks, who would grow up and would become a great man and would become a deliverer from Israel and lead those Israelites out of Egypt back to the promised land. But we'd be remiss if we left off inferring that he was the ultimate savior because he wasn't the ultimate savior. Because 1,500 years later, one even greater than Moses would come. And he too would be born in tumultuous times. He too would be spared infant infanticide of the Hebrew baby boys in his day and age. But this one, Jesus, would grow up and would live the life that none of us could live so that he could die the death that all of us deserve so that he could conquer the grave that none of us could conquer so that he could infuse us with his spirit daily, sustaining us so that we need not fear, but know that he is with us. So my invitation to you today is this. If you've not put your trust in him, if you've not put your heart into his hands, then the step for you today would be in the same way that Jacob had put her heart and her baby into that papyrus basket, that you might put your heart into the basket of his hands, just give him your whole life. Others of us, you say, I've done that before, but maybe there's something that even as we've been talking, he's been saying, but you're holding on to this pretty tightly. In fact, I think, more tightly than you're holding on to me. Maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a child, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's someone you love with a diagnosis that's troubling you and it's consuming you. And maybe the Lord's saying, hey, 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 I'm still here, trust me. Maybe it's your job, maybe it's finances, maybe it's your success, maybe it's a dream that you've had. Maybe the step for you today is to say, I'm going to surrender this. I'm going to hold it open-handedly. I'm going to let you have it, Lord. And I'm going to ask you to come through. You know how I'd like you to come through, but even if you don't come through that way, I'll know still you are God. And you are in control. And I'll be found faithful. And that's what I want for all of us. So why don't we put our hearts into the hands of him? even as she put her baby in that basket. Let's give our lives to him once again. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this story, for the way that just even getting into this fascinating story of Moses the deliverer. There's so many things that you want us to see, lessons you want us to learn and ponder. 
and trust that you want to build. Lord, my prayer for all of us is that you would make us more fully able to surrender and to trust you. Lord, forgive us for the times that we clutch so tightly. We clutch on to the things of this world, and certainly we clutch on to the, to the people of this world that we love. And sometimes we cling to them as if they might be our Savior, but you're our Savior. And it's you that we must cling to most of all. Lord, would you help us to open up our hearts anew and put our trust in you, Jesus, that we might experience your peace that surpasses all understanding that guards our hearts and minds in you, Christ Jesus. And as we go into the series further, won't you bless us and sustain us and equip us and make us courageous and teach us more lessons about the things to which you are calling all of us. And thanks that you have good plans for us all. Plans not to harm us, but plans to prosper us. We pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.